Hello everyone, and welcome to this performance of Bach's masterpiece, St. Matthew Passion, a company premiere by LA Opera. My name is Todd Calvin, and I am the president of the Opera League of Los Angeles. Now in its 40th year, the Opera League is the primary volunteer support organization for LA Opera. We invite you to join us. For information on how to become an Opera League member, please stop by our table, which is located just outside the main entrance to the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, or visit our website at operaleague.org. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce LA Opera's Richard Seaver Music Director, Maestro James Conlon. Los Angeles Opera is producing a series of performances in collaboration with the Hamburg Ballet of choreographer John Neumeyer's renowned production of Bach's masterwork, the so-called St. Matthew Passion. I'm James Conlon, and I am welcoming you to join me for what I think is a very special experience. Let's start with a reflection written in Berlin in 1910 by an artist particularly known for his controversial interpretations of the keyboard music of Johann Sebastian Bach. I refer to Ferruccio Busoni, one of the musical giants of his time. He wrote in German, and here it is translated and lightly paraphrased. A musical work exists whole and intact before it has sounded and after the sound has finished. It is, at the same time, in and outside of time. Right out of the gate, I come to a screeching halt with a question. Is something wrong with this picture? Is it legitimate for an opera company to present a ballet of a musical work written for a church service meant to be sung without costume, scenery, and stage action, let alone dancers? The purist will say, no, it is not legitimate. And perhaps it might be better for that person to excuse him or herself now. No hard feelings. I can certainly understand you're not wanting to see one of your favorite musical works that you are accustomed to simply hearing. But I invite you nevertheless to consider in the spirit of openness that a theatrical realization of the passion would be an emotional response to, an expression of, and a commentary on a work constructed from a core biblical narrative that is already itself an emotional response, expression, and commentary of its own. Like the expanding concentric circles of waves resulting from a stone dropped into a body of water, it would be a response to a response to that very core narrative. Let's start with some background and why I think the inclusion of a visual theatrical aspect can be a plus not a minus, provided that musical values are scrupulously respected. Bach was born in Eisenach, in the German state of Thuringen, in 1685. Prodigiously gifted, he was known first as an extraordinary keyboard virtuoso, organist, and builder of organs. He moved to Leipzig in 1723 at the age of 38, and lived there composing and performing music for church services until the end of his life in 1750. He produced over 1,000 known pieces, extensive keyboard works, sonatas, concertos, dance suites, preludes and fugues, vocal and choral music, including some 200 cantatas, both religious and secular. He wrote at least four passions, two of which have never been found. Few musical works have impacted the world as deeply and widely as this masterwork. 
which, to use its proper title, which translates as The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to the Gospel of Matthew. The meaning of the word passion has evolved over time to its contemporary usage to denote strong, powerful, intense, and often obsessive emotions, love, hate, desire, the very stuff of opera. But its original Latin meaning is suffering. And in this case, Christ's suffering, crucifixion, and death make up the central culminating story from which the Christian narrative and religion began its development. Bach's Matthew Passion is a monumental, universal piece of music that, having attained wide recognition, has left a deep impression on Western civilization, has been transported to all corners of the globe. Its universality has far exceeded its very specific origins. Rooted in 18th century German Lutheran theology, it was written to serve a religious service with a full belief system accepted by its authors and the congregation it was instructing. Its roots were specific, but the power of Bach's undisputed musical genius went on to profoundly touch and inspire people of all religions and those with no religion at all. Musical settings of Christ's passion grew in medieval Europe contemporaneously with passion plays, which were usually outdoor theatrical presentations. They were essential religious services during the Holy Week preceding Easter. The Passion later became considered a subset of the oratorio, a word also derived from Latin and meaning place of worship. The term denotes, with very few exceptions, a religious work. One note of clarification. In any discussion of European classical music from the 16th century into the 20th century, the word religion is practically synonymous with Christianity. This is due to the virtual monopoly that Christian churches held on institutional spirituality throughout Europe, both before and after the Reformation and the Count of Reformation. Though Christianity was to splinter institutionally, the sum total of its power, even divided up into many denominations, was to remain unchallenged for several centuries in Europe and its colonies. As I mentioned before, much of the text of Bach's Matthew Passion is drawn directly from the Gospel of Matthew. This brings us to troubling questions concerning this work, as well as Bach's other surviving passion based on the Gospel of John. Are there passages or references in these works that are offensive to Jewish people? If so, can and should we perform them nevertheless? All racism including anti-Judaism, is condemnable. As citizens and as artists, we have an obligation to do so wherever we find it. We have to acknowledge the terrible cruelty and violence towards the Jewish people throughout history, including, but not limited to, Europe and Christian civilization. Where do Bach's passions stand in this greater picture? I suggest that the passages that offend our modern sensibilities are quotations from scriptures, which means that neither Bach nor his Christian contemporaries would or could question them. To the degree that these passages are problematic, the responsibility lies with the scriptural narrative of Matthew and John. The literal quotations from the Gospels contain a narrative that would appear to squarely place blame on the Jewish people for Christ's crucifixion. Bach's contemporary commentary in the Arias inhabited by the full genius of his music, offers a much more nuanced reaction and meaning to the narrative, as do the chorales sung with the congregation. The tenor of Matthew's narrative is problematic and is exemplified and reaches a climax when the populace cries out, his blood upon us and our children. Matthew 27, 25. These words have been used for centuries to justify Christian hostility towards the Jewish people. I wade with trepidation into these waters as I am neither a theologian nor a biblical scholar. There is a plethora of literature that suggests that the interpretation of these 
and other offending passages is extremely complex and resistant to simplistic answers. It is well beyond the scope of this discussion. It should be noted, however, that Bach did not invent the story told in the Passions. At the time he was composing, these scriptures were universally considered beyond questioning by Christian authorities and followers. This is still true today for many. In the interest of brevity, let me summarize. The Gospel of Matthew was written in the late first century. The scriptures came to be known through translations with all the attendant ambiguities of that process, and their aim was to convince people under Roman domination to view a new form of Judaism, which gradually became known as Christianity, as legitimate. The primary goals of these scriptures were, first and foremost, to convert Romans, and second, to stay out of trouble with the Roman authorities to avoid persecution. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, both Jewish and Gentile, were under the domination of the Romans, who would have had exclusive authority to execute. Most likely, the authors of Matthew found it in their interest to shift accountability for Christ's crucifixion from the Romans, who were probably responsible, to some portion of the Jewish population in Jerusalem of the time. For instance, the Jewish authorities. This narrative, fully susceptible to poetic license, expanded over time to include the entire Jewish race. Bach and his librettists used Martin Luther's German translation of Matthew 26 and 27 for their passion. Luther both amplified and diminished the responsibility of contemporary Jews, sometimes contradicting himself. His translation confuses the matter further by using the collective word das Volk, the people, not differentiating, as apparently it was in the original Greek, between Hebrew and Gentile, or between Jewish bystanders and the authorities. But Bach, in fact, speaks with his own voice as well, and this is of essential importance. He takes a step in the right direction. The aries and chorales taken together emphasize the idea that those responsible for Christ's death were not they, those present at the time of the crucifixion, but we and I, all who lived in Bach's time and we who live today. We are the sinners whom Christ came to redeem. If we, they, had not sinned and did not presently sin, there would have been no necessity for a Christly mission. Bach admonishes us to recognize this sinfulness, to express our regret and sorrow, and to benefit from the blessing of Christ's generosity and self-sacrifice to remove its stain. Echoing the words of Ferruccio Busoni, it is the musical essence which is the most important factor. The infinite riches of Bach's music are not restricted to believers or to an imagined musical elite. Like all music, it is for everyone, and its beauty has defied any limitation of time and place. It is heard around the world without reference to its specific denominational origins. The composer is, if anything, mitigating the full force of anti-Judaism in the Gospels and has opened a path to transcendence through the power of the musical means he has employed. The domination of Christianity fundamentally impacted the social development of both oratorio and opera, but the similarities between the two are still overwhelming. Both are large musical forms with soloists, chorus, and orchestra. Both genres are built with a dramatic narrative, recounted or acted out by singers. Storytelling, some of it in the form of recitatives, alternate with reflective solo arias. Choruses both participate in and comment on the action. Oratorio was to be sung in a church or concert hall, whereas opera was conceived for the theater. Now, religion and theater made for uncomfortable bedfellows, not because of their inherent natures, but because powerful authoritative ecclesiastical institutions willed it so. Both forms were written for people gathering for a communal experience, one to participate in religious rituals, the other to enjoy the edification and entertainment of theatrical performances. 
But there was and is a common link, a common essence beneath the surface, and that is drama. Ritual plays a large role in religious service of worship, but even pure ritual is in part dramatic, just as the theater involves various modes of ritual. So drama and ritual, operatic theater and church oratorio are two branches of the same tree. Richard Wagner drew much of his thinking on the presumed unity of Greek theater, a religious ritual festival of music, lyricism, theater, drama, and dance. However, for me, the powerful unity of music, as I hope to demonstrate, towers above all. <laughs> Because powerful church authorities opposed and largely prohibited the depiction of religious, biblical, or scriptural stories on the stage, a need was born. And oratorio also developed as composers felt the urge to take those subjects banished from the stage and set them to music. Those stories were simply too compelling and numerous to be neglected. Oratorio served as a haven for those many biblical works. The divergence of the two forms proceeded, became standardized, oratorio for scriptural sacred stories, opera for secular pastorals, comedies, and dramas often drawn from Greek and Roman antiquity, and thus pre-Christian. Handel excelled in both areas. To my mind, because he saw and was seemingly untroubled by the commonality of musical drama in both genres. In considering a theatrical presentation of the Matthew Passion, it should be noted that Bach had no reason or motive to write an opera, as there was not yet any significant operatic activity in Leipzig during his lifetime. In contrast, George Friedrich Handel's life in London provided for and demanded works in both. Amazing though it is to us today, the Matthew Passion remained unknown and, aside from several annual church services in Leipzig, was unperformed for over 75 years after Bach's death and more than 100 years after the first few performances in his lifetime. In 1829, a 20-year-old genius, Felix Mendelssohn, a recent convert to Christianity, deserves the credit for conducting a first public performance in Berlin. That performance revived, initiated, and revolutionized a vastly expanded appreciation of Bach's genius. For almost 200 years since then, the Matthew Passion stands at the summit of Western civilization's artistic achievements. Bach's plan for the mammoth work is constructed on a simple principle with three layers. The first layer is drawn from the Gospel of Matthew's 26th and 27th chapters. An evangelist, Matthew, we imagine, tells the story of Christ's final earthly days leading to his crucifixion. The copious text is sung, but with the emphasis on the word more than melodic invention. We know this form well as recitative. It is generally discreetly accompanied by a cello and or bass and a keyboard instrument providing what we know as a basso continuo. Other characters, Judas, Pilate, Pilate's wife, the high priest, Peter, two maids, for instance, make brief appearances. Most importantly, Jesus himself speaks throughout these recitatives. But he is enveloped in what has always been described as a luminous musical halo, string instruments, a sort of oral beatific light. It accompanies him until his dying words on the cross, where its stark and sudden absence signifies his abandonment and the end of his earthly life.
The second layer is the chorus, which, like the ancient Greek chorus, has multiple functions. It alternates between active participation in the scriptural narrative, occasional commentary, emotional response to that drama, and fortifying the chorales sung by the congregants. It functions sometimes as the crowd, called the turba, interacting, often vociferously and aggressively, with the protagonists. It is divided into two separate groups, partially to provide musical variety, producing what in our day became known as stereophonic effect, but which was properly termed antiphonal music. There is a dramatic subtlety as well. The first chorus is identified with the Daughters of Zion, an allegory for the Jerusalem of Jesus and his contemporaries who lived the events in real time. The second chorus are referred to as the faithful, including Bach's 18th century congregation and those of us latter-day participants who hear the story from our contemporary position. The chorus sometimes sings alone or antiphonally against one another and sometimes in great resplendent unity. Both choruses sing together 15 four-part chorales, presumably leading and strengthening the congregation. The Reformation starting and particularly with Martin Luther, institutionalized singing hymns while discouraging the visual art in church. Consequently, the marriage of Bach, Luther, and the faithful was theologically coherent. These chorales were often drawn from popular melodies which Bach harmonized, subtly putting them to dramatic and theologic use and constantly varied to fit the dramatic context, as in the final chorale sung at the moment of Christ's passing. Through these hymns, time implodes. Spiritually, there is no temporal nor geographic distance between us, ancient Jerusalem, the protagonists of Christ's passion, nor Bach's congregation. The third layer is represented by four soloists who sing 15 arias, 10 of which are preceded by richly colorful accompaniments, often of woodwind instruments. These more ornate and expressive accompaniments differentiate them from the dry recitatives of the evangelist narrative. The soloist's function is primarily to listen, to comment, and to react. Their contemplative recitatives and arias are the emotional core of the entire work, providing the expressive tapestry with a wide range of emotions, from sorrow, pain, repentance, to joy in the hope of Jesus' redemptive message. The texts are not scriptural, but written by Bach's close collaborator and librettist, Christian Friedrich Henrici, who wrote under the name of Picander. There is 
no question that these two men's purpose was massively didactic. Both were thoroughly schooled in theology, professed followers of Martin Luther, and wrote to instruct their congregation as if they themselves were preachers. The resulting work, however, surpasses any doctrinal bias, presuppositions, or limitation. The transcendent power of Bach's music, like a mighty Gothic cathedral, has spoken powerful to the spiritual and secular world in a unique way for the past 200 years. In advocating for a balletic, operatic Matthew Passion, I reach back more than a century to ally myself with one of the great musical and cosmopolitan genius of his time, Ferruccio Busoni, 1866 to 1924. Italian-born composer, pianist, writer, and critic. He was controversial in everything he touched, but his challenging thoughts and insights are amongst the most mind-expanding that I have ever read. In 1921, he created a sketch for a dramatic staging of Bach's Matthew Passion. He envisioned a stage plot as the view towards the facade of a cathedral, with a chorus seated on the first level above the ground, which would function, as we already mentioned, as participant, commentator, and congregation. Above that, there would be a walkway connecting the two conventional spires where Matthew's dramatic text would be enacted. His sketch visualized the inherent musical structural layers which we have just discussed. Buzzoni writes, systematic groups divide into narrative, action, contemplation, and moral. These four groups follow each new event. The moral is announced through the chorus in the four-part chorale, and the contemplation is inserted in the form of an aria. Though Bozzoni also, rather controversially, suggested cutting and abridging the piece, the essential insight here is that he believed that the passion could be well served by a theatrical device. In his imagined representation of the Gothic cathedral's facade, we see a fixed position of the chorus, which sits right and left. In the middle pulpit stands the narrator, dominating all and acting as the center from which the threads of the action and score extend, radiating in all directions. Busoni, in another text, this one arguing in defense of piano transcriptions, goes way beyond the limitations of conventional thinking. Though specifically beginning his argumentation about the piano, he goes on to attack what he considered limiting, narrow-minded, unjust, and misplaced hostility toward all musical transcriptions. By the following, we will see what he meant and how vast his vision was. I bear these very important words in mind while either contemplating or conducting a theatrical performance of the Matthew Passion. In 1910, Busoni wrote, it is only necessary to mention Johann Sebastian Bach in order with one decisive blow to raise the rank of transcription to artistic honor in the reader's estimation. He was one of the most prolific arrangers of his own and other pieces. From him, I learned to recognize the truth that good and great universal music remains the same through whatever medium it is sounded. He cites a second truth, that different media each have a different language, their own, in which this music again sounds somewhat differently, but never destroys the original. He continues, quote, my final opinion about it is this, that notation is itself the transcription of an abstract idea. I repeat that because it's important. Notation is itself the transcription of an abstract idea. The moment that pen takes possession of it, the thought loses its original form. The intention of writing down an idea necessitates already a choice of time and tonality. 
the idea becomes a sonata or a concerto. That is already an arrangement of the original. From this first transcription to the second transcription is a comparatively short and unimportant step. The performance of a work is also a transcription, end quote. He emphasizes that a rearrangement, even a performance, is a transcription and that it can never do away with the original. Quote, the musical work exists whole and intact before it has sounded and after the sound has finished. It is, at the same time, in and outside of time. So, as I understand Buzzoni's thinking, the distance between a so-called pure Matthew Passion and one with visual, theatrical, and dance elements is essentially irrelevant. Let us keep our minds firmly fixed on that word, essence, and not appearance or form. In Buzzoni's essay, The Essence and Oneness, or Unity, of Music, he wrote, quote, the time has come to recognize the whole phenomenon of music as a unity, and no longer to split it up according to its purpose, form, and sound medium. It should be recognized exclusively by two premises, that of its content and that of its quality. By purpose, I mean one of the realms of opera, church, and concert, and by form, song, dance, fugue, sonata. By sound medium, I mean the choice of human voices or instruments, including the orchestra, quartet, and piano, or the many combinations of all of these. Music remains, regardless of form, exclusively music and nothing else, and it only passes over into a special category through a description or text to which it is put and the situation in which one places it. Therefore, there is no music which can be stamped and recognized as being church music." Unquote. By implication, for instance, in Buzzoni's argumentation, the polemics of performance practice authenticity and so-called original versus modern instruments, which has dominated the Baroque and classical music world, including Bach, for the past 40 years, might not even get traction. Well, I said he was controversial, and so are many of his ideas. But they are also staggering challenges to many of our preconceptions. Let those ideas swim around while you listen to and watch Bach's Matthew Passion in a transcribed, operatic, balletic form. If we can liberate ourselves from some of the limiting notions of the word form, dismissed by Buzzoni as irrelevant or insignificant in comparison to the music's essence, we can open ourselves further to the omnipresent, perhaps omnipotent power of Bach's music, perhaps even to Buzzoni's notion of music that simultaneously exists in and outside of time.